Alright, hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen to Sketchbook Audio Visually. I'm your host Ryan Sketch and uh, today a lot of stuff has happened in the automotive industry recently so I want to like tackle all of it but there are also a couple things that uh, people keep asking me questions about regarding uh, automotive design and <clears throat> even character design and, and stuff like that like how to get into it, where to go. I'm going to talk about all of that, give you guys some hints and some tips. Uh, so stay tuned because this should be a pretty fun episode. And quick shout out to all my viewers and subscribers. I appreciate it because that's what keeps me going. So let's dive into it. All right, we're back here at Sketchbook Audio visually. Thanks for sticking around. So I mentioned that there were a bunch of things that happened in the automotive industry, a lot of reveals. Uh, we're going to talk about that right now. And then later in the show, I'm going to talk about how to get into automotive design. If you're like a high school student or even if you're younger, which is awesome if you want to start doing that. Uh, and this also applies to getting into stuff like video game design or uh, character design for movies and television. It's just a lot of fun and it's worthwhile. So hopefully I can give you guys enough information so you guys can go ahead and tackle it on your own. Uh, but you know what? If you do choose to go those routes, let me know. I would love to, you know, give a shout out to support you. And if you have an Instagram account that you'd like to share with me on this show, um, you know, hit me up and uh, I'll make it known to the world here with my podcast and uh, video. Which, by the way, if you didn't know already, you can watch this on YouTube and Spotify. Wow, crazy. Uh, just Technology is just jumping around and things are getting pretty uh, awesome with making podcasts. And I thought that adding video to it would just help really explain what it is I'm trying to talk about so you guys can actually see what it is I'm talking about. Anyways, let's jump into this. I have Autoblog pulled up because Autoblog is like the source for automotive news. I'm not sponsored by them, but I love them. Uh, and we are going to talk about everything that's that's coming up. For starters, um, there's a really cool car. I'm just going to mention it right now. We're going to we're going to jump into it later. But uh, if you ever heard of the company Lancia, you probably haven't if you're in the United States. But if you're in Europe, you probably do. And if you do know who Lancia is, uh, you know that they actually have a really storied history, and they're legendary in their own right. And uh, they are making a comeback. We might not see it for a few years, but they're well on their way. And uh, I'm excited to see what they actually produce for a production car. But we'll talk about that momentarily. First, I wanted to bring up... Uh, so... <laughs> um, oh, I gotta find it. Where did it go? Oh, yeah. So this is just some talk about tech. And I want to watch this video real quick because I think it's really cool. And it's definitely something that's in the very near future. We're already seeing companies like Ford making um, and uh, Fisker made screens that tilt or rotate. And that's really cool. But what's the next step? Well, probably similar to cell phones. The next step is to either fold screens or have them roll up kind of like a one of those heads up displays that goes up like this. But what if the screen was actually like flexible and it rolled in and out and it would be uh, less moving parts and um, just easier to do. So you could probably have a bigger screen too. But I'm going to show this video for you guys real quick and you guys can take a quick look at what Hyundai and their technology arm Mobis is capable of doing. So clearly we can see uh, that <clears throat> we have a dock or a stand that this screen slowly rises out of and it can do different heights to show different information all the information is scalable and I mean it's pretty wild the screen can get as big or as tall or as small as uh, you want and you know just looking at it from the start one of the downsides is the fact that it's a very cumbersome device it's quite large but I think in the very near future, they will be able to scale this down pretty quickly. Technology and computers, they grow exponentially. Uh, things get smaller exponentially, but when you have this proof of concept like this, it, you know, it's not gonna take long for A, other companies to figure out what they did to make this happen, and B, uh, for this company, Mobis, to get it into their cars. Now, if, the cool thing about this is regardless of how big and cumbersome the device actually is, 
they could easily make it so that you know that's hidden inside your ip or your dashboard and uh you know there's nothing else really needs to be there when you have something that's as just based off of a screen and a computer uh, you don't have any moving parts really so if you can limit the amount of moving parts that you have uh it, it, you know it kind of doesn't matter how big it is that could easily fit where a gauge cluster is just get rid of the gauge cluster in itself because a typical standard analog gauge cluster has quite a few moving parts um, then it has a lot of lights and a lot of just wires hooked up to it whereas something like this you could put behind where that would normally be have to have just like a flat surface maybe some cool textures or some cool uh materials there in place that you can feel and touch but then behind that in just a tiny little slit excuse me on the dash you have this screen that rolls up and then hides away i really like that idea um i'm excited to see where that future takes us and uh you know maybe we'll start seeing this in cars probably within the next five years i'd say given how we've seen a lot of technology trickle down uh, pretty quickly to smaller cars um, I think this is something that we could easily see in the very near future, especially if it's a cost savings. If Hyundai and Mobis can pose this as a large cost savings over um, using analog gauge clusters or anything that they're currently using, like a big screen that's you know has glass and all this other fun stuff, um, I could see auto automakers and OEMs really jumping on this as quickly as possible. Okay, so that was the, that was the one tech I wanted to show you guys. We're going to jump into some other uh, exciting news. Real quick, before I get too ahead of myself, I wanted to mention the new Jeep Wrangler. Now, you guys have probably already seen it. It's been in the news. It's made its rounds uh, in the <clears throat> um, automotive world. But there are some things I want to quickly just run over because uh, a lot has changed, but a lot has stayed the same, for better or for worse. And I think there's a lot more pros than there are cons, uh, but there is one big con that I want to talk about, and um, it's definitely something somebody uh, who's interested in a Wrangler might want to take note before they, you know, decide to pull the trigger. Okay, so first and foremost, we're looking at uh, the 2024 Jeep Wrangler, which is technically like a a mid-cycle refresh at this point. Now the JL in its current body style came out in 2018, alongside with the 2018. JK. Uh, that was the previous generation. They ran a bunch of them at the same time to kind of make a ton of money while they could, give people a cheaper alternative to the JL, and uh, I think it worked pretty well. So now we have this, uh, we're what, six years into this. Wranglers typically go for about 10 years before they ever make any major changes. So it's not surprising that uh, Jeep decided to keep this pretty low-key with their changes, but I think those changes are significant enough that they're worth taking note of. First and foremost, you see that this Rubicon <clears throat> has quite a bunch of tech and new stuff for off-roading. One of those things being a from the factory worn wench. That's cool. And then you get this whole new steel bumper with the uh, brush guard, bull pusher, whatever you want to call that thing, uh, hook nose. Um, and then you get these big massive led fog lights i have no idea who they're made by maybe like baja design or casey highlights hella i don't know they're cool uh and then you get aev wheels these are my favorite wheels i love these and i can't remember exactly what they're called but uh they have another wheel that's really cool that you've probably seen on any american expedition vehicle and that's the pintler it's a five spoke uh, very traditional very casual but pretty cool looking wheel you also get these massive tires. These things are huge. And I think these are um, 37s, maybe maybe a little bit bigger, but we'll take a look at it. Uh, and as you can see down here, it clearly states that this is a AEV level two. So there's a level one, a level two, and I think there might be a level three. I don't know, but needless to say, as you go up in the levels, as you level up, uh, you add more tech, more off-road uh, ruggedness, and your price tag just like skyrockets. If you don't know anything about American Expedition American Expedition vehicles, uh, they are based out of Wixom, uh, Michigan. So they're right here in my hometown, not too far, maybe 30 minutes away. And what they do is they take 
donor wranglers, whether they're brand new right off the uh, the dealer lot or they uh, take a customer's that gets donated to them and then they just outfit it with all of their gear. They make lift kits, they make um, full underbody suspension kits, they have the push bars, they have the front and rear bumpers, they have snorkels, they have new, just a whole array of wheels and tire packages and uh, a bunch of other things, including interior um, adjustments as well. So um, while we're talking about these Rubicons and these Wranglers and all these fun things, uh, let me also mention that the Easter Jeep Safari happened not too long ago, and we will take a look at some of those concepts that were shown because uh, there were some that were just awesome. And uh, I, I was really hoping to get out there this year, but due to financial constraints and having a kid, it wasn't really possible. So uh, yes, if you didn't know that already, I am a father. Yeah. So excited to bring him into the Jeep fold at one point in time in his life, and uh, let, let's hope it sticks. So what you can see here is a Jeep Wrangler Rubicon 4xe. Now this is that one that's really expensive. We'll talk about that later, but uh, there's a new push bar set up on top of the factory steel bumpers with the removable end caps. Um, new wheels, which are pretty much what you get off of the Wrangler 392, just a different color. They're a dark uh, grayish black, uh, and then a few other things like the tire package. Um, and you can see right here, this is the 20th anniversary. So the 20th anniversary, the Wrangler itself has been around, um, at, well, the Rubicon has been around for 20 years. So they are celebrating it with a very expensive but very cool Wrangler Rubicon. And you can get it in just a regular uh, ice-powered or 4xe. And I don't mean ice like uh, frozen water. I mean ice like internal combustion engine. So that's one of them. Um, here's the beautiful Earl Grey, which I love. And this is a Sarge, which is a dark green, hydro blue, very popular package. Now, while we're looking at this one, this is that anniversary AEV model. So you get some extra accessories like these uh, flags, um, these matte black pockets. You get the AEV, AEV wheels, like I mentioned. You get a new steel bumper, which is by AEV. AEV. And uh, it looks great. You get the AEV badge. So, you know, it's just like a seal of approval. You know that you're getting high quality components. Um, you get new rock rails with uh, their heavy duty, which, you know, these extend outwards too. So that's, you know, some people call them bash bars. Some people call them rock rails, whatever you want to call them. Uh, they actually have a built-in step as well. And they're uh, that heavy duty. This one, I don't know if this is anything like some of the previous Mopar ones, but <clears throat> those ones used to uh, be able to store water inside, which is pretty interesting. So there was some plastic along with some steel. Uh, but these look very durable. And you have the big giant D-rings here. So you could add some extra hooks if you wanted to. Um, just a really cool package. And then here is uh, another 4xe in the beautiful purple, uh, purple rain, if you will. And a lot going on there. So <clears throat> here's a lot of the Wranglers that were uh, doing their... Safari uh, while kind of showing off the new 2024, but also, you know, having fun with the Easter Jeep people. Uh, another feature that you've probably seen that's a pretty standout thing is this grill. It's a little controversial. Some people think it got a little too small, a little too squinty, but frankly, I like it because there's a lot more detail. Let me find the picture of it. There you go. There's a lot more detail in here. Not only does this have like an upward lip, rather than just going straight down. This has this <clears throat> little kick. Then of course it kicks in for the headlights <clears throat> and then it goes down. The grill texture or the honeycomb grill is a bit different as well. And then like I said, you got the AEV bumper package, but uh, this grill also incorporates body color around it while kind of narrowing down each of the seven slots. I like it. I think it looks great. I think it, you know, it's an easy, quick change to have made. The good thing is if you don't like it, you can just throw on a, a 2022 or 2023 JL's grill. Not that big a deal. Uh, everything is just, you know, it works. And they're really easy to take on and off. So, you know, it's not that big of a loss for somebody who ends up getting one of these. Um, <clears throat> there was a, uh, oh, let me see if I can find it. There was a bunch of pictures here. Um... Maybe if I click on Jeep Wrangler. No, it's going to take me to that. I want to show you guys kind of the interior of this car because that's where most of the 
um, upgrades really occurred and it makes the interior of the Wrangler more livable, quite a bit more tech. Uh, but let me see if I can find it first and then we're going to get back to, let me um, pause my video here so I can scroll through some of this stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about what was shown at the Shanghai debuts. Um, the Chinese market is really showing off some sweet cars. I just wish some of them would come here to the United States to give more competition. But at the same time, I'm kind of like, eh. a lot of them look, look the same. And that's not a great thing to happen when, you know, people are just very ADD these days. You know, everybody wants to look a little bit different and stand out a bit. So, you know, it's, it's not a great thing that they look a lot of like, and even worse, a lot of them are just own and clones of their parent company. And some of these parent companies are huge and they own so many different uh, subsidiaries. And it's it's quite like General Motors about 15 years ago. So um, let me keep going. Uh, just, just so many freaking new cars that are coming out. Uh, we are going to talk about the Ram EV or the Ram Rev. I definitely wanted to talk about that uh, for a moment. Jaguar is about to re reinvent itself, and that's pretty exciting. Uh, one of the big news topics that's going on right now is these EV tax credits. A lot of these companies are losing it, or they're cutting it in half because of Biden's um, regulations and laws on the EV tax credits. So for better or for worse, and that's kind of made a lot of controversy for Tesla because Tesla keeps cutting back the prices on their cars pretty significantly so anybody who ordered their car like last year and they had to pay whatever expensive rate it was then but somebody else gets a newer model with some newer stuff is going to pay less than the previous guy did that's it you know that kind of hurts a bit <clears throat> and yeah, i don't necessarily think there needs to be lawsuits going on around about it but there are and you know that's just the way it is um, while I continue to look for the vehicle I'm looking for, uh, just know that the Jeep Wrangler 4xe Rubicon 20th anniversary, especially if you get the AEV package, you're looking at close to, if not over, $100,000. So get ready to spend a lot of money on a Wrangler really soon. Um, oh, you know what? Here's the EV tax credits. I'm going to bring this up just so we can talk about it a little bit because uh, there are people who are very interested in owning an EV here in the United States, and you probably want to know what can you save. Uh, Polestar showed off a new vehicle. It's the Polestar 4 and 5, so we're going to talk about those. Or the Polestar 4, sorry. Um, the 5 is coming. And then we are going to talk about some upcoming cars, and uh, one of them being a couple Chinese vehicles. That we might get, we might not get, who knows. Um, this fun one from Buick. I was really surprised to see that Buick revealed a new car. And it's for the United States. Uh, even more interesting is the price of it. But uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Man, I cannot for the life of me find this vehicle. You know, I, I'm going to briefly mention this Maybach EQS 680 SUV. Partly because I hate the name. Mercedes needs to fix their naming scheme and because uh, it gets really, really confusing really quick. And uh, it, it's it's a super expensive luxury car. But when you have an EQS uh, sedan and an EQS SUV, it gets pretty confusing. And I can't imagine going out and buying one because you could easily say I want an EQS and they, you know, ignore anything else and forget to ask you well did you want the suv or the car version and uh you know things just go awry that way um so there's another company that's worth noting and that's zeker which is basically a, a sister or cousin i guess to polestar which is also related to volvo and they're all underneath this big umbrella uh, so that's that's something that's uh, very interesting. We do not get the Zeker products, and they are very cool, so I'm pretty heartbroken about that. But I'm going to let it go because the new Polestar vehicles that are coming are awesome. Here we go. 
now you guys can see this and we can talk about it. Here is the new 2024 Jeep Wrangler Willys in a two-door guise in Sarge Green with the new grille. Now this grille actually uh, appeared first on the 392, but they decided to make it, uh, you know, across the board standard. It comes in different colors, different, slightly different grill textures, but overall, you know, some people don't like this fake vent down here. Some people think that it got too tiny and too squinty. I frankly love it, especially since you can swap this out for the previous generation um, and your headlights stay the same size, your fog lights all stay the same size. It makes it very easy for customizing and for uh, aftermarket brands to, you know, make things that fit and go well with your car. At the end of the day, you still get this frame on the outside that's body color. Uh, and you get more tech and stuff for the price on your cars. So that's a good thing. I think people will look over and look past the grill pretty quickly. But let's take a look at some other features. So new wheel packages, wheel and tire packages are out for the 2024. Um, here's one of the Rubicon Special Editions. You get the red leather interior. That's gorgeous. But here is the Big Bang that I'm excited to talk about. Okay, so the new interior, it's interesting. Jeep was very smart with how they went about this. They didn't change anything below the radio. They just kept the radio and outwards and above it different and everything else stayed exactly the same. So it makes me wonder, could I actually go and get a 2024 interior and just plop it on top of mine? Probably, uh, but it's gonna be expensive, I can imagine. There's a lot of components that go into it and there are a lot of little things that got changed. So let's dive in a little closer to this. Uh, I cannot zoom in on this picture anymore, but you can see right out the gate, there's a new screen. Um, there's new leather material here with some little silver accents. Uh, it's a much higher quality look and everything just feels more techy and just have a higher quality. And they added so many different um, variants. And I think that's gonna be really uh, important for Wrangler, future Wrangler owners, um, especially people who, you know, they see the outside and it's very customizable. Well, the inside should be that way too. For a while, the Wrangler hasn't really had that many options for the interior. It's been black, um, black cloth, black leather, uh, the Sahara and the Rubicon get that stitching on the seat to say Sahara and Rubicon, but that's about it. Um, the dash can either have the Rubicon's red um, fascias or uh, the other ones like the Sahara, like mine, get a black leather with white stitching. Um, I think the 392s get that leather with like a goldish bronze stitching. It's like an orangish bronze, actually. Um, some other ones include, uh, you get like the tan cloth or the tan, uh, it's like a darker saddle, brown, tan seats. But they never went to the extent of changing a lot of the dash colors like they did in the JK. The JK actually had a really cool setup where the entire bottom portion of the dash was tan if you got tan seats, and the rest of it was all uh, black. But I think with this new Wrangler, it's gonna give them more abilities to add more to the vehicle, especially customization. Um, another feature that has never happened before in Wrangler, and I've always joked about this with people who have the handlebar and they put these Amazon special pockets into that handlebar. And if you were to get in an accident where the front end gets hit, uh, all that stuff is going to fly up and all of a sudden become projectiles and could hit you in the face and injure you. Jeep, I think, did a smarter thing and they did a little bit uh, like what Toyota does and they added a deep pocket underneath that airbag. So, you know, you're not gonna put like a knife in there, but you could put like change and that's not gonna really hurt you in, in an accident. Uh, maybe Kleenex, pen or pencil could hurt if you got hit in the face with it in the right way. So I wouldn't suggest putting that there, but they added more storage uh, places on the Wrangler and I think that's gonna be pretty important. So let's see if we can find some more. Another feature, that I mentioned is the new radio, but I like how it wraps around into the gauge cluster, but doesn't have like two giant screens that become one essentially like Mercedes and Kia and other companies have done. They managed to keep the gauge cluster basically the same as the 
uh, previous year, but then they added this huge, huge screen with way more capabilities than the current gen. And I think that's gonna be a huge selling point. Like I said, all the controls down here stay the same. Um, the upper portion of this dash now has sort of that leather texture. I don't know if this is real leather. They're stitching up top. It certainly feels pretty high quality um, and looks pretty high quality, but you know, I, it's a Wrangler. It's probably some synthetic material that's easy to clean. I hope it is anyways. And then of course this part up here with the stitching, uh, like the Sahara is real leather. Um, oh, here's another option. So you get this really nice tan insert or like a sandstone insert with these goldish inserts and that looks really good and this is on a more base model so you get more color whereas the current one you get like a dark gray almost black matte finish here and it you know it looks good but they could have added different colors it didn't necessarily have to be body color but that would have been pretty cool uh, but having this new texture here looks great and it certainly brings the vehicle more upscale especially when you get a lower end model like the sport or uh, the willies Here's another option where you get that dark gray, but you get a nice contrast stitching. This is like a orange or gold stitching. That looks really good. Now it's hard to see up here on the dash or the top of the IP, but uh, Jeep says that there's new mounting spots here for some accessories like a phone holder or a GoPro camera. And they've probably taken a little page out of Toyota and the Tacoma's book. Uh, and that's smart. That's a genius thing to do. These almost look like extra speakers, so I don't know if they've enhanced the Alpine uh, sound system, but hopefully if they did, uh, it'll sound as good, if not better, than what the current one sounds like. Um, some more images here. <clears throat> it's not wanting to... Well, it's not wanting to move forward in... Let's uh, refresh the page and see if we can't. <laughs> That's funny. It's not. Uh, it's not letting me progress forward. Um, while I look for another page with these, um, with these images, there are uh, some other cool features that I really like about this Wrangler, and most of it has to do with that, um, that new screen, that new head unit, but. Uh, I think people will be pleasantly surprised. I mean, even the high end, uh, the high altitude, it's got new wheels. The bumpers are body colored like they are currently, but they just look better. Um, yeah, I don't know. Why can't, why won't it let me look at other pictures? Yeah, it like does not want me to go past here which is just nonsense um let's see what else i can find on the google the google maybe right here maybe right here maybe this will show me exactly what i want this is on what website is this uh the autopian good website definitely a lot of information a lot of high quality uh pictures but okay here you go you can see the the way that this grill has evolved. So it used to be, um, you know, a little bit more squared, but still had that keystone look. The fog lights were incorporated into the front bumper, or actually these are more like a daytime running light. Your fog lights are down here, but, and your side markers here. Whereas on the current 2023 and, and below, uh, similar headlights, your side markers or daytime running lights are moved over to the side. You get these nice uh, DRLs, um, for the halos and then you also have your fog lights down here now we come up to the new one the headlights stay the same but you know they still tuck into the uh the outermost grill um, inserts and then you have a new texture on the inside it's just a bigger honeycomb which looks really cool uh, but then you have these controversial vents down here yeah there's a lot more sculpting going on here but i you know i don't i'm happy they didn't make this just plain and make it flat with the silver. I'm happy they made this extra sculpting here. Um, and it helps tie everything in really nicely. And I think that dimensionality for it uh, just helps bring this Wrangler, which is a pretty old school vehicle, uh, further into the future. So yeah, here's the uh, textures. They're a much larger honeycomb. 
um, rather than the little tiny ones. The little tiny ones, there was like five across, and then, you know, it went down like 20 times. But overall, each um, of the pillars, the seven slots, are a little bit smaller. And yeah, that's a, just a nice close up of it. All right, here we go. Here's the interior. So uh, there is a new rear view mirror. Um, I think it's a little bit more high tech, some more features incorporated into it. Uh, the vents that used to be circular right here are now gone and relocated under here. I don't hate it. I think it's smart, but at the same time, I like these spinny vents. They're just fun and they're uh, better for changing direction um, a little bit better. So here you go. That's what mine looks like right now, but then they changed it to this. I believe the gauge cluster is the exact same. I don't think anything has really changed. Although looking at this, there's like a bar down here and I don't see that here. So maybe that's something that changed a little bit, but that's really just in the housing, not so much in the gauge cluster itself. Uh, I don't see really anything else that changed. The hands have changed. These are orange. Whereas these are white and it goes white the whole way around. I don't know. This looks like a four by E. So maybe that has something to do with it, but don't know. Um, here's a Rubicon. So the Rubicon gets red stitching on the steering wheel. It gets uh, um, these little red accents on the corners and the texture on this dash insert is really cool. Um, hopefully I can find an up close picture of it because it's definitely something worth noting. Uh, another feature, if you're an off-road person and you really like to know about towing and going off-road, uh, there's a new Dana 44 float. So basically, uh, it allows the weight of the vehicle to not be stressed so much. Um, so it uh, right here, it says it right here. Um, it puts the weight of the vehicle onto the axle tube, not the axle shaft. So it's just better forward overall but um, it also allows the vehicle to tow more uh, a significant amount more so it goes from 3,500 to 5,000 pounds that's pretty good um, and then now the Rubicon X gets 35 inch tires you know bringing this much more in line with the Bronco and what the Bronco can offer uh, it's just not as big as a vehicle as the Bronco now I'm still not finding um, the interior pictures I wanted for this for this but uh, maybe I can maybe I can bring them up here I know this is the site I was just on it still won't let me do it okay oh you know what what if I keep going backward no nope, it won't let me so I'm just gonna edit this whole section out because this is really annoying um Okay, here we go. Now I have all of the pictures. All of the pictures. So, here we go. Uh, the 4 by e gets the blue stitching, but it's a little bit more prevalent. And then you get these little accents here in the corners. Um, you'll also notice these are the half frame doors. So the metal doesn't go all the way up. It stops here. Um, and I really like the fact that there's this pull strap here rather than the door handle that's up here. Uh, pretty... It's a minute detail, but I really like it. It makes the vehicle seem more capable, um, more just bare bones. Uh, but it's it's in a 4xe, so you still get quite a bit in the vehicle. Now, the 4xe has also gone down to the base model, too. So the base Wrangler can get 4xe as well, which should help you get a 4xe for much cheaper than you would a Wrangler 4xe, which is well into the seventy five and $80,000. So that's cool. Um, here's the high altitude. You still get the sun slider sunroof if you want that, which is a nice feature. Ah, here's the Rubicon's dash. Um, little red accent showing the Rubicon versus the blue, which is the 4xe. Uh, you can see the little tray right here. Nothing down here has changed. Um, red seats is an option for this Rubicon uh, in this model, but another cool feature about the Wrangler is that it now, for the first time ever, offers power seats and quite a significant amount of adjustability uh, for a Wrangler. It's pretty surprising. 
Um, and here you go right there. So it tilts back, um, the butt tilts back, goes up and down, forward, back. Uh, this tilts forward and back. The lower portion of the knee kind of, so it slides forward and back and then tilts up and down. And then you get the lumbar support, which goes up, down, forward and back. That's a nice feature. And this, the red seats just look great, especially on that Earl Grey Wrangler. Using Uconnect 5, it's a great system. It's super fast, and uh, there's a lot of features in here. I'm not going to run down every single one, but basically, if you want to go off-road, it has all of the off-road pages, and it really puts Toyota and Ford to shame when it comes to um, usability and uh, customization. So this was a, a Rubicon 392. There's the charge port for the 4xe. What uh, there were a couple other little details, uh, so maybe oh paddle shifters paddle shifters have, are more prevalent on the Wranglers for the twenty twenty four model year. Interestingly enough, you can put the paddle shifters on any Wrangler as long as it's an automatic. So that's pretty cool. And there are a couple companies out there that um, offer that kit, and it's pretty easy to do. It's probably like a thirty minute install, but. Uh, overall, if you like paddle shifters and you want to be able to control the vehicle's engine speed better, I would highly recommend it. Um, like I said, it's a pretty easy thing to do. Here's one feature that they don't talk about much, but it's green. There is a green interior. It's like a sage green. Hyundai has been doing this recently and Kia. So if you are into unique colors for the interior of your car, sage green is an option. Now, interestingly enough, uh, a few years ago, I think it was like the 70th anniversary, they offered green seats. It was very limited. Not many people got it, um, but it looked really good. And if you're getting a green Wrangler, eh, you know, you might as well. I have a green Wrangler, so I would love those. And um, it looks really nice on uh, on that, like even this Willie Sarge. Here's um, the new cloth material that's on the base models. It looks good with that orangish gold contrast stitching. And what just happened there? What just happened? I just I'm gonna edit that out too. No, stop doing that. Okay, so I guess that's the end of the slides. Uh, I wanted to show you that the Wrangler Rubicon had a really cool texture on the dash, and I think it's like that shark skin material with like a texture on it that kind of looks like a camo similar to what Toyota has done with their TRD Pros. I don't know, it just looked really cool, and I you know, hope, hoped I could show it to you guys, but it doesn't look like I can. Um, this is the best picture I can show you, and I don't know if I can zoom in. Oh, yes, I can. Glory be. Ah, it's still all pixelated, though. But there is a texture on here. It's not just a flat black, uh, but it looks really good, and it's similar to what Jeep did with the Compass Trailhawk, so uh, I like that. And, um, you know, easy to clean still. Everything in here is really easy to clean. Oh, they are also offering for the first time a full vinyl floor. So something like you would get in a truck, now you can get in your Wrangler and you don't have to worry about cleaning carpet. You just wash out the, uh, hose out the vinyl floor and boom, done. You can also remove said vinyl floor. And if you wanted to put cloth in it later down the road, you could, uh, or vice versa. So that's definitely an option you can take on if you were to get a Wrangler. Um, okay, so let's, since we're talking about Wranglers, let's just jump into the Eastern Jeep Safari. Here is what was shown this year, and man, do I wish I was there, because these are freaking cool. Uh, let's kind of break this down. We'll start in the back here. This back one is the um, Wagoneer Overland model. It's a concept right now, but I guarantee you Jeep will do something to allow uh, these people who are spending over a hundred grand on their Wagoneer to turn it into something that's more off-road capable and fun. Uh, back here is actually an old Cherokee. It's like a 70 something and they put it on a new Wrangler chassis, but not just any Wrangler, a four by E. So it's a plug-in hybrid and it's actually quite potent, but they kept the body almost entirely the same. Uh, they just painted it and made it look really cool. And yeah, um, this one over here, it's a blue one. Jeep has done this every year with their Easter Jeep Safari, uh, as far as I know. And um, they continue to do it at uh, other major auto shows like NIAS and New York International Auto Show and Chicago. But they always have a model where it's just all Mopar parts. 
it's the Mopar, the Moparest of Mopar vehicles. Um, it's or the most Mopar vehicle of Mopar vehicles. It has every accessory that Jeep offers from the Jeep Performance Part catalog on the vehicle. So a roof rack with a light bar, the mirrors that are uh, moved to the door hinge mounts rather than um, or on the A pillars rather than on the door themselves. Uh, the removable doors are gone. Um, so now you have the tubular doors, a different front bumper with the stinger, push bar, whatever you want to call it, bash bar, different rock rails with the side steps, uh, a lift from Fox Shocks, Go Fox, um, tons of other accessories. And we'll take a closer look at that one. The next one is this pinkish one. This is not Tuscadero pink. This is a totally custom pink. I hope this is the color that they swap Tuscadero pink out for because this pink is sexy. Um, I was a little bit underwhelmed and hurt when I saw the Tuscadero pink in person. In pictures, it looked just like this one. But um, in reality, it's a little bit more like the bikini pearl. It's, it's kind of hard to explain. It's just not as vibrant as I was expecting it to be. Anyways, here uh, is the Scrambler. It's a 392 Scrambler. So they took a Wrangler. Uh, actually, I think they took a Gladiator. And they shortened it. They made it a two-door. They shortened the bed quite a bit. They lifted it. They gave it um, bigger wheels and tires. <clears throat> uh, they put in that engine with a full, clear hood. You can look down into it and see the engine. It's awesome. And I think the body, if I'm not mistaken, is like all carbon fiber. So it's super lightweight. Very cool. And uh, I also love the top. It's just this bikini top. And uh, we'll take a look at that one as well. Up here, right in front, is the uh, Wrangler Magneto 3.0, and they've lightened it even more. They put the clear hood on it. Um, I think the fender flares are carbon fiber as well as part of most, if not all, of the body parts. Um, the new grille, obviously, and uh, different wheels and tires. I think they also made the battery more potent, so it, therefore it's more powerful than the previous, the 2.0, and certainly more powerful than the first one, the 1.0. Uh, but my favorite feature, it's an electric car. It's a fully electric Wrangler with a stick shift. Yes, Jeep, please, if you're watching this, make the Wrangler with a stick shift, 4 by e or just a fully electric one. People will buy it, even if it's low volume. What does it matter? People are buying Wranglers and Gladiators with that same stick shift. It can't cost that much to to translate it over to the 4 by e right? I don't know. I'm not an engineer like that, so maybe it does. Um, or maybe they're just so concerned with it being so low volume that you know it would cost more. I don't know. Charge people more for the stick shift. I got charged more for my Acura Integra, Integra to have a stick shift, so why not? I don't know. Anyways, the last one is this Gladiator Sideburn. It's kind of like the Mopar one back here. Uh, where it's just a ton of Mopar parts, but a lot of these Mopar parts are conceptual. They're very not to the market yet. I don't know if they ever will be, but it would make sense to make a lot of these. So let's take a closer look at some of these. So the Scrambler we have right here, it has these killer wheels that you would likely see on a Viper, um, but they are here on this 392 Scrambler. With This is what people want. People want a two-door Gladiator, call it the Scrambler, give it a shorter bed, and give it some more unique body panels to separate it from the rest of the pack. Could be low volume, could be high volume. Um, this one being as much carbon fiber as it is, I don't know. Uh, it's super lightweight, it's super sexy. They chopped the roof so it's a lot lower. It just looks amazing and I love it. Um, you also notice that the seats are this beautiful uh, plaid, blue, green, and um, well, blues and greens. Uh, plaid you still get the bronze hooks but they're a little bit different on this one and then of course the new grill then you get some vents on the fender flares which is pretty cool very baja uh, and i like that so um okay so it did start life as a four-door wrangler not as a gladiator um so they took those back doors off and then just made it a truck bed which if you were to do that to a current wrangler anyways you would get a pretty solid truck um i don't know what you would do with those back doors You'd have to move the B pillar back or fill in that back with, I don't even know what you would do. Maybe something like this, whatever. Maybe shorten the, the body a little bit. 
don't know. But you could do this. Uh, and it just looks super cool. You've got this tire rack back here. Um, this floating spoiler that looks really cool on this nice roll bar. Uh, I just This thing is awesome. I would love to have one of these. And Jeep, I think this is definitely something you should make. There's a lot of people demanding to see this vehicle uh, go into production. And uh, it would... It would even if it was high, uh, low volume and a high price, I think people would buy it. You know, Wranglers are already getting so expensive. Why not make one that's as expensive as a Viper and just call it a day? Uh, you probably would never see this clear hood, but super cool. Love that. Now the Cherokee 4xe. Very retro, very fun. Um, I love the colors. And hopefully they have pictures of the interior. Yes, they do. So you've got... Uh, a similar motif as you do on the outside very 70s very retro like that very western patterns here in textures i like this it's, it's kind of native american um very earthy you got this nice brown that reminds you of the mountains up here um this orangish red which can remind you of the sunset or the painted mountains the roof even on the inside of this is spray painted that's cool um but this is a previous so the 2023 wrangler and they put the um, the body of the Cherokee on this. So pretty cool what they did there. Now the Magneto 3.0. So you get this soft top up here, which I think either has a solar panel or a, a, like a vinyl roof here so you can see through it still. Very similar to the Scrambler in the sense that you get that truck bed in, an, in a two-door body. But uh, again, it's electric. So now you get... From 625 horsepower to 650, more torque, 900 pound foot of torque. There's more power in this than there is a Viper. This thing is beastly and just sexy. I, and I, they probably would never put it in this body, but to see this in just a 392 would be perfect. Um, I don't know what shocks they use. They either use Fox or, I don't know, Falcon? Who knows? But it's pretty cool what they did, and it's still a stick shift. Uh, so that's pretty sweet. Um, yeah, oh yeah, so that's a that's a see-through vinyl top that's blue, um, tinted blue. This is tinted blue. Everything's painted blue. And this gives me something I might want to do to my car, just paint the whole entire back of my car uh, a different color. Okay, the Grand Wagoneer Overland. So you already have this big, monstrous leviathan of a car, or behemoth, if you will. Uh, so why not throw on some off-roading gear, lift it, and... Um, give it this insane wait until you see this pop-up tent this isn't just a tent this is like a mini hotel room um on a expensive hotel room so you get the fog lights the led fog lights down here uh the grill has these reddish orange textures to match the tow hooks very similar to the trailhawk models that we see today um, you get the Hurricane Twin Turbo V or I6 inline six. It's a 3.0, so 510 horsepower. That's a lot of power coming out of a twin turbo inline six. Um, you get the off-road uh, light bars up here. That's pretty banging. But here we go. Solar panels up here. A ventilation escape hatch thing here. Little windows here. Insulated panels. It's on a very uh, durable rugged frame and they it looks like they added some support here too to not only disperse the weight along the roof of the car but i don't know the paint scheme on here is different than any other gladi or uh, wagoneer they added beefier fender flares beefier tires and um, so the skyloft is from red tail now my guess is this uh loft up here probably starts at about five grand minimum because every other pop-up tent i've seen so far is like two grand minimum and nowhere near as nice as this so you have the inside of the grand wagoneer which looks like a nice little studio apartment uh, they get rid of the back seats but then you have this cutout here so you can get into the skyloft and uh just enjoy a sleeping area there i mean you could probably sit here and work from home kind of deal you have an amazing sound system for Macintosh. Excellent lighting. It's comfortable. It's quiet. Uh, yeah, why would you not? And then you have the dual screens here with the dual screens up front. This thing would be awesome. It says plush carpet, uh, throw pillows. I don't know. 
I, I would want one of these in a heartbeat if I had the kind of money. All right, Wrangler Rubicon 4xE. That is all it's called. Um, it's just look at it. It's perfect. It's beautiful. It's like a, a sexy mix between Purple Rain and Tuscadero Pink, and I love it. So they just call it New Magenta, and that's it. <laughs> There's not much else to it. There's like a powder blue hooks, um, but what's on the inside is what makes this thing really interesting. Um, there's like a cheetah print up here. Now, oh, by the way, all of the decals, all of the custom decals that you see on every one of these cars was done by Five O'Clock Garage, also known as uh, the Jeep. Um, oh, I just forgot what their Jeep Design Studio or something. So if you go to Mopar or if you go to Jeep.com, you can find ways to add different decals, like on the hood, um, on the body side. Lots of cool things, but they all come from uh, my buddy Matt Zubrick and his company, Five O'Clock Garage. So you get a Jeep, it goes to his place, he prints out the decals. By the way, he also does 3D printed decals, which is mind blowing. You got to check them out. And so follow him on Instagram, Five O'Clock Garage. That's five, uh, I think five O with a little, I don't know, Five O'Clock Garage. You'll find him. It's pretty easy. Uh, awesome group of people, and they made all of the custom graphics. For all of these vehicles and um, I love them so furthermore on to this Rubicon 4xE you have the leopard print up here then on the inside I believe on the uh, glove box there's like a um, shag carpet but it's the same color as the exterior of this car so I that's pretty cool um, you can see right here this is the half doors the half metal doors um, now somebody mentioned the other day how can like can the hard top does the hard top have uh, the normal hard top does it have pop out panels in the back like this one and the answer is no the only way to get these removable side panels other than a cloth top is with the sky slider um sunroof the power top the one touch power top um it's a canvas top it slides all the way back so you get these rails here these thicker rails than what are normally on a wrangler they're quasi permanent you can remove them and then put on a different hard top or a regular soft top it's just there's a lot of bolts you got to have it aligned properly so that the canvas slides perfectly it's a bit of a pain in the butt but you could do it so <clears throat> but you have throwing these half doors and then this guy and this thing just looks like a safari ready vehicle i'm actually surprised they didn't put a third row in this vehicle and maybe face it outwards. Who knows? Maybe that's something you could do later down the road. But I really like it. It's got the, I think these are the Pintler wheels, the 17-inch American Expedition vehicles, um, which also supply the front and rear bumpers. Okay, last but not least, probably the coolest looking one, and that's the Gladiator Rubicon Sideburn. So it starts off as a Gladiator, all of this, and then they add in this whole new truck bed. Now, what I was thinking could easily come from Mopar is this uh, side bar here with the side steps built in. And then there's a lot of tie downs and cool things going on there. Another feature that's a uh, concept right now, but I think they are gonna make it, is this bench. So this grill uh, surround actually folds down and becomes a bench. You just put like a padding on there if you want and plop your butt right down there. The tailgate also acts as a bench, so you could do that too. Uh, I also like this conceptual light bar up here i think that looks great it would look good on a wrangler on a gladiator whatever they need to make this um but the back end the whole bed very conceptual all these panels that are molded in these products like the uh, water tank the extra gas tank there's a like a jack that goes in here <clears throat> they're all molded into uh the side of the bed it makes it a very utilitarian vehicle and it's certainly something people would want I just don't know if it's something that they would ever do, but Mopar could. Um, you can remove the truck bed on a Gladiator pretty easily. It's not hard. Uh, it's just, you know, you got to lift it up. You got to be able to move it, all that fun stuff, and then replace it with this. I don't see them not doing it, you know, even in just like a limited run. I don't know. I think they should do it too. But everything here is really removable. The sideburn name comes from these things right here, which look like sideburns. Um, it has a different rooftop. Just a lot of stuff going on here. Here's all the uh, integrated things. Like I said, there's a bench integrated into the tailgate. 
Um, and then there's these little pockets here. Here's your gas tank. On the other side was the water tank. Up here, I don't even know what's up here, but there's a spare tire here. Maybe it's where you could um, put like a, a bike, a motorcycle, just kind of mount it up there. I don't know. Um, oh, they just look like they're little storage boxes that are strapped down um, with these straps here. So just a really cool looking vehicle. Like I said, I think they could make these easily. No problem. People would pay for those. Uh, it's just this whole bed here. I, I don't see them doing it. But then again, they do make the tubular doors, which, you know, are cheaper. Uh, but they could make this. Just make it a three-piece. Yeah. I mean, it's not like the bed is any different size than a normal one. So who knows? Maybe they do. If there's enough people who want this, they could easily do that. And last but not least, the Wrangler Rubicon 4xe. They call it the Departure, but this is basically a mobile Mopar catalog. Everything. You get the stubby bumper. I think they are going to make this bench. You know, it's right here. So it attaches to that steel bumper and it just folds down. Pretty cool feature. Uh, you have the tubular doors. You have this mole system here. You have the Mopar grab handles. These are all something you can get. Um, the wheels, uh, the bash bars slash uh, rock rails, those are there. You have the Fox shocks on this one, the Warren wench. Uh, the seats are probably the one thing I love the most about this car, that and this. Um, I just wish they would have an up-close picture of that, which I don't think they do. But that color in person is gorgeous. I got to see that uh, not too long ago, not knowing it was going to end up on this vehicle, but... Um, yeah, so this uh, right here, I don't know if Mopar offers this, but this is something that you can get from other companies. You just have to take off your tailgate, take off the hard top, can I have a soft top, and then you have this tire here. But I mean, I guess if you're going out into the desert just to have a good time, you know it's not gonna rain, then who cares? Or you could put the fabric cloth top um, on the back and it would cover all of this and you shouldn't have uh, too much of a problem. I don't know. Do a little research and find out and uh, go from there. So, okay, let's move on to some other stuff. Spent a lot of time here talking about Wranglers. Um, I'm really interested in this Yakima rack, but we'll get to that later. <clears throat> so I went through all that. Now we're going to talk about some things, that some sneak peeks and some concepts that came up. I'm going to take a quick break. I need to drink something, and uh, we'll come back. So you know, go use the restroom. Go grab a bite to eat. Come on back. All right, folks, we are back here at uh, Sketchbook Audio, visually. Mountain Dew, please sponsor me. I love this. I am addicted to this. And it has nothing to do with the fact that there's alcohol in here. It has everything to do with it's Baja Blast in a can. And there's a little bit of alcohol in here. Yeah, whatever. So let's get back to this. Um, <clears throat> you're probably looking at the screen right now and going, Ram rampage where have i heard that name before well if you're from the 80s or the 70s you probably have heard of uh everything from an el camino to um ford and gm's utes that they had in south africa and australia and maybe even heard of the ram rampage it was a car truck um i don't know how else to explain it uh chevy also did something like the ssr which was very similar in you know, in concept, but uh, this unfortunately is not going to be for the United States, at least not now. But what we can see, and I'll show you the video right now, is a sneak peek at a compact truck, probably very similar to what Fiat sells as the Toro, um, or maybe even the Ram, I think it's 100, which is a very similar car, or maybe even as the Mitsubishi Triton that gets uh, transferred over to a Dodge in other countries as well. Now, Dodge and Mitsubishi sold a truck side by side at one point. It was the Mitsubishi, um, oh, I forget what they called theirs, but uh, Dodge had the Dakota. They were basically the same exact truck. Um, Mitsubishi changed their front end and some of the body side panels on the truck bed quite a bit. The interiors were quite different, but um, very similar trucks. And uh, it could happen again, probably not with Mitsubishi, maybe with Fiat. 
but this is definitely something that needs to happen here in the United States. We need a compact, not a midsize, we need a compact truck that's fun to drive, that's affordable, and that's fuel efficient. So let's take a look at this video to see what at least Brazil's gonna get. So as you can see already, um, you know, they're sketching it. I don't know you guys might get audio. I don't think you're doing audio right now, but um, you'll, it's, it's in uh, Portuguese right now, so, uh, many of us are going to be able to understand it. But you can see right here that they're borrowing heavily from uh, the current RAM as well as maybe even the RAM Rev. Um, interestingly enough, they don't have the new font on here, but it still looks really good. These might be slightly embossed into them with these uh, letters individually put in there, but I like how the camera is built into the handle here. That's nice. I'm not seeing a split tailgate like the Fiat Toro has, but that's okay. Uh, this is probably still a very functional vehicle. You know, this is going to look more like a Ram truck than it did, or than it would um, what the original Ram page looked like. And I'll bring that up in a moment here, but uh, you can see already this has a lot to do with the current gen Ram 1500. Big bold letters here. Um, you know, the grill looks more. A can't sit there. It looks like there's these little indents, which is what the current Ram has, less like the Ram Rebel. Vai ser o primeiro veículo well sculpted. produzido aqui no Brasil. Foi desenvolvido de ponta a ponta com a participação dos Estados Unidos em todos os momentos. I have no idea what they're talking about right now, but um, it appears as though there is a light signature, maybe that goes up and under the hood. I actually saw a Ram today where somebody took a strip of LEDs and they put it underneath here and it followed it very nicely. It just kind of looks like a mustache to me, but you know, overall it's a pretty cool feature. Uh, I love these tats. It's definitely a tattoo I would get. Anyway, moving on. The clay uh, sculpture of this. So what we can take away from here is that, yeah, it still carries a lot of what the current gen Ram 1500 has. Uh, there's a there's a ledge here and it very nicely wraps down. A little bit of a light catcher right down here. The trapezoidal fender flares instead of the circular ones. Um, not much of a spoiler up here, but a pretty low roof line. I don't, I don't know if this greenhouse is, is going to be uh, factory right here or if it's going to be um you know smushed a little bit uh for sort of a concept but uh, uh, i just love the clay sculpting process uh -huh. i think it's amazing it's so fun Muita capacidade, muita and for those of you who are tuning in now as opposed to the first half of the segment, I'm just going one, over some cars that were shown in the, the past uh, a couple of weeks. Um, Eastern Jeep Safari just happened, so I'm going to talk about those. And then, the the and then there's the Shanghai Auto Show, which is the Auto Show for Japan. Or China, well, and Japan. I should say Shanghai. I should know that. It's a pretty fun looking truck. So, you know, you had like a Charger Daytona body and then you had a truck bed. And it was very similar to uh, what Chevy and Ford were doing. Um, the Dodge just made their own. And I, I thought it was pretty freaking cool. Uh, it just wasn't well received later in life. It, it died pretty quickly. Uh, but if you can find one, um, they're worth a decent amount of money if they're clean and in good shape. But yeah, that's not what we're getting. Okay, let's move on to, I mentioned the Shanghai Auto Show. Uh, there's all, of the, I don't know any of them. There's probably a hundred different uh, automakers in China alone. Um, so here's just one of them, uh, Xpeng. It's a, it's a handsome looking vehicle. Uh, I like these light bars that a lot of these Chinese companies are doing or even just Asian companies are doing. 
very Mustang Mach E mixed with a Mercedes EQ um, C or an S or an E uh, SUV or sedan. So it's not a bad looking vehicle by any means. It's just, it's kind of hard to you know, kind of Tesla Model X or Model Y look to it. There's just so many of these and some of them tend to look very similar and I don't, I can't compare them all right now, but I will give them credit for trying to be different and doing interesting things that you just don't see on any car whatsoever. Um, you know, there's just a lot of big juxtapositions of forms and shapes, but this certainly looks like an electric car. I totally see it. Uh, I love the graphics on these cars. Um, this greenhouse, it's very sloping, very like Porsche Cayenne. It's, it's a clean, it's just a clean design. Um, I like this spoiler that pops up. Uh, again, very Porsche, very Audi. Um, interiors, interiors on a lot of, and this kind of looks like uh, Jaguar I-Pace, but <clears throat> the interiors on a lot of electric cars tend to look a little bit more sterile to me and less inspiring to me than some modern cars but you know not everybody is looking for the wild crazy designs they're just looking for something that functions nicely like this i mean these seats go all the way back giving you somewhat of a bed um maybe this is uh, autonomous i don't know what level of autonomy this is but um it looks like a car that you could spend more time being driven in rather than actually driving um but I will give them credit for color combinations like this. This blue, this white, and the gray. Love that. Uh, Kia is like the only car, Hyundai and Kia are like the only ones doing, and Genesis actually, are they like the only ones doing it at an affordable level. Um, is this a car I would like to see in the United States? Mm, there's some features about it that I would like to see, but at the same time, I see a lot of Jaguar I-Pace right here for it's a good thing. I love the I-Pace. It's one of my favorite cars. Certainly, probably my favorite EV. But, uh, you know, it's this could quickly be a forgettable vehicle. And I hate to say that, but it'll eventually blend in with the rest of them very quickly. Uh, this is not what I wanted to show. Okay, so that's one of their, that's their podcast. Definitely check out Autobox podcast. It's fun. Uh, it's very well done. Okay, minivans. Who cares? I do. Um, we don't really have minivans here in the United States anymore, with the exception of the Sienna, the Odyssey, and the, uh, well, the Kia Carnival, and the, uh, of course, the Chrysler Pacifica, which is just a staple of minivans here in the United States. But in other countries like China, Buick, Lexus, um, Honda, they have sexy minivans at Mercedes. They are just gorgeous. Although, a little wild but you know it's got this floating uh, roof line a reverse shark fin like uh, the odyssey has but when you get on the inside of this car it's just nothing but comfort and luxury every part that could be touched with craftsmanship and luxury was done and it was done extremely well kind of has the corporate steering wheel but you have this beautiful wood grain that's not just a very natural look to it. It looks very uh, industrialized, um, crafted, and that's why you get these nice angles, these nice uh, patterns here. Um, you get this beautiful bronze inlay wrapped around or tucked into this leather that's floating inside this other piece of, I don't know, blue, dark grayish blue. I love blue and white. I think they're a great color combination. Then you get these seats in the back that have their own monitor. They have their own vibrations. Um, you know, it's a massaging chair. And they extend to make this thing more like a limousine than it is actually a minivan for carrying your kids around. This is something you get uh, chauffeured in to go to um, an opera or something for the uh, the uber luxury people, not uh, not your family necessarily. You got this massive screen here so you can watch movies if you have a longer trip and, uh, and you know they're showing you you know you're going on a trip and then you get to watch all this stuff um oh this is funny so this is the regular picture taken in the studio and then they they plop in uh, a person i don't know if he's photoshopped in there or what 
and then they put a picture on the screen and then put in a background. But uh, man, you can the opulence in this vehicle is insane. We would never have a minivan like that here in the states. Uh, people would just rather have a Rolls Royce or a Lexus a GS or ES, and um, or sorry, GS and LS. Uh, I, I just, whew, man, I would love to just sit in here and and feel the comfort. There's just so much going on that's high quality and well crafted and thoughtful in a vehicle like this. And, uh, you know, like I said, not something we get here in the States. We get this, which is more of a family hauler rather than a limousine. All right, this is an interesting one. This is a departure from um, future concepts and anything like that. This is actually an homage to an old model from 1986. The G-Wagon is like the pinnacle of off-roading luxury um, and what people aspire to have when it comes to safaris or uh, if you're a basketball player or a football player, chances are you've had or will have one of the uh, G-Wagons. But on their 500,000th model since, God, they've been making this car since like the 50s or something. And it was... Uh, Oh, I don't even know. But they had this model that looked just like this. And <clears throat> Mercedes said, okay, on the 500th model, we're going to do a one-off and uh, give it a retro makeover. So it got kind of dumbed down wheels, nothing too fancy there. Tires that are eh, capable, but not like super off-road. A lot of plastic black matte black bumpers in the front grille. Um, the really cool roof rack, the safari type roof rack, and a lot of other features. But, and I don't think they show a picture of what it originally looked like, but needless to say, it looks almost exactly like this. And you know what? I give Mercedes props for continuing to make this SUV the way it's looked for years, just decades. And uh, so, okay, so the G Class um, was introduced in 79. I was a little bit off on when it came out. But as it's gone on, they've thrown in AMG. Um, there's a lot of horsepower. There's a lot of capability. I mean, if you want to go off-road and be able to do anything, you're going to want a Mercedes G-Wagon, a Unimog, or um, like a, a Land Cruiser or Defender or something like that. Those are the vehicles that you really want to have to go off-roading. Wranglers are great. Uh, don't get me wrong. You could easily have... All of that other stuff that those cars have for far cheaper in a Wrangler. But at the same time, Wranglers are getting way more expensive than they ever have. Uh, and, you know, eventually, I mean, a 392 Wrangler is up in the 80,000s. So we put in a 4xe Rubicon, the 20th anniversary, and the AEV Stage 2 kit. You might as well just buy a, a G-Wagon at that point. And that's what I was trying to say earlier um, in this segment was... Wranglers are expensive now, and they're only going to get more expensive for better or for worse. So, you know, it really isolates and ostracizes a lot of people who really want to. I've wanted a Wrangler for two decades and couldn't because they were just too expensive. And when I could afford one at one point, gas was at $5 a gallon, and I couldn't afford the gas. So, you know, there's that. Okay, Honda is about to show off a ton of electric vehicles here is what they're showing off. Um, I think these are mostly ones for China, but at the same time, we're gonna get a lot of these here in the United States. And a lot of that is gonna be partnered with General Motors and the Ultium battery platform. I bet you if you read this very carefully, you will see somewhere in here about GM and its Ultium batteries. Um, yeah, right here. Uh, the Honda Prologue that shares the General Motors platform. Um, which is very similar to one of these two vehicles right here. Now, this one actually looks a lot like the Cadillac Celestique. I don't know if they would actually do that, but if Honda paid enough money, they could get GM's platform for the uh, Celestique and turn it into a really fancy Honda. Acura doesn't exist in in Japan or China. It's Honda. So like the Integra here is an Acura or the NSX. It's a Honda Integra or a Honda NSX back there. So 
you know, while Acura is the luxury marquee for Honda here in the United States, Honda is just on its own um, in Japan and China. Uh, Toyota has Crown and they do have Lexus, but that, you know, has only really just recently happened. Uh, well, Crown's been around for a while, but I mean Lexus uh, being in their home market as well. <clears throat> okay, next one is uh, here, the Grecale, which um, got its, I think, plug-in hybrid. Uh, um, yeah, so, it, you know, a dual motor powertrain. Um, I don't know if it's full EV or not. It looks like it is. Uh, so you have the new Gran Turismo, and it's a Fulgore or Fulgore, I don't know how to pronounce it, but uh, that's the fully electric Gran Turismo. Now we're going to get a Grecal or Grecale, uh, Fulgore, and um, it's full electric. So <clears throat> I think it looks great. The Grecale, as it was, was a handsome, charming little crossover that would, you know, easily pair up nicely against uh, the Porsche Macan. But now, throwing in the electric stuff, I just think it looks great. And that color is gorgeous. Not much to go off of here. It's just this front three-quarter view. But um, Maserati is on its way to victory again and, and really becoming a, a luxury marquee that's respectable. So good for them. I like that. Uh, can't talk too much about this. All we get is the like rear corner of a Jaguar. But one thing you can see is there's a lot of hard lines here. Not something that's well known to Jaguar. Jaguar has done curvy, soft lines on pretty much everything. Uh, with maybe the exception of the I-Pace, there's some hard lines. But this is very different. Land Rover and Jaguar, uh, Land Rover not so much. They've They've done a great job of changing who they are and, and being a better company. Um, with the Defender, you got the 90, the 110, the 130. Awesome SUVs. Uh, the Land Rover, um, Range Rover Sport, uh, the Range Rover. All of those are looking amazing and very well crafted. Absolutely gorgeous. And they really make Land Rover stand out. But Jaguar's kind of been lagging, with the exception of maybe its coupe um, <clears throat> and the I-Pace. Nothing too exciting and exhilarating has come from Jaguar in a bit. So this is going to be breathing new life into Jaguar, and it's a push to be entirely EV. So looks like we're going to get to see this uh, by the end of 2023. So that's cool. Um, I'm excited. Here you go, right here, the new Range Rover. I saw one of these the other day on the road. And I was blown away. The pictures do not do it justice. The lighting on this matte paint um, and just everything about it was just perfect. I really like the fact that these glass windows, all of the windows, um, there's almost no bezel. There's nothing really. St it's pretty flat down the side, which gives it a very clean surfacing. And um, it, it looks just like the clay model. It looks perfect. So... Uh, if Jaguar can bring in some of that flavor and taste that Land Rover has been uh, doing, then I think they'll do very well. Okay, the Nissan Horizon concept. Uh, kind of like Horizon, but I guess they came up with a new word, Horizon. I don't know what it means. Um, but, you know, it says it right here. Revealed in Shanghai, probably for China only, could come to the U.S. I like it. The Aria is a gorgeous looking SUV. Um, a little almost minivan-ish, but when you get on the inside and you actually get to spend time in it and walking around it, it's quite smaller than a minivan, um, and it's very well proportioned to be kind of sports car-ish for a crossover. I guess if you want it to be a little bit more rugged and capable, you would go with something like this. The Aria, I would never take off-road, ever. Wouldn't even go on sand roads. I'd keep that thing on the streets and be done with it. This... Looks like I could take it off-road and have some fun with it. The one thing to note about this, though, is it's very conceptual. Everything about this just reminds me of Mitsubishi's concepts and how awesome they are, but how over-the-top they are. And the likelihood of ever seeing it look like this in production, pretty slim. We might get a silhouette that looks 
similar to this. We might get these little fins up here. We might even get lighting that's pretty close to this. I mean, Cadillac did it. it would jack up the price quite a bit, but uh, I like this integrated roof uh, crossbar or these side rails. The roof is right here, but then the crossbars go into the spoiler and then they're pretty tight onto here and there's a gap right here. That looks great and it would be nice if that came to production. Of course, we have the standard uh, par for the course on a concept car pillarless entryway and you have the suicide doors in the back uh this uh, the um normal doors in the front but they open super wide over exaggerated and that's so that you can see completely on the inside of this car and you can really get an understanding of what went into this vehicle i mean there's a really beautiful surface right here that just blends in perfectly and then it's broken into white and black here it's like a yin and yang um, I, I, I like that. And these seats look comfortable. They almost look like they're floating. Uh, maybe they are kind of cantilevered. Maybe they're mounted to this armrest. I don't know. Maybe this armrest is mounted to the seats. It looks really good. And this is very similar to the Aria. The Aria has uh, buttons that are um, capacitive touch. And they're hidden underneath a wood grain, which was really cool tech. I love the fact that they did that. I personally like buttons and toggle switches, but if I were to look at any automaker that was doing buttons that are, you know, capacitive touch and don't actually have any function, like uh, moving up and down or a toggle forward and back, um, I, I think Nissan has done the best. Uh, Hyundai is probably a close second. Um, Volkswagen completely ruined it, which is why they're having to go back to buttons in the first place, but uh, I like this. I think this could be a very handsome off-roading vehicle if they ever made it and made it look just like this okay on to um this one i was surprised i had no idea this was happening but furthermore i had no idea ford was going to had decided to make this in china i think that's going to bother some people not everybody um but the people who live in the united states who buy lincolns to begin with are very american you know they're not looking at Hondas or Toyotas or Acuras or Lexuses or uh, BMWs or anything like that. They're looking at Lincoln, American made. And being that this is made in China, I don't know if that's going to hurt them. But it is a really sexy vehicle. It's also very powerful. There's a plug-in hybrid variant, also extremely powerful. And it just looks great. Uh, you have several different versions of it, as you can see in the front end here. Um, there's this face, which I think is a little bit more subdued, a little bit more luxury. Just look at the grill, too. Uh, it's very well sculpted and luxurious. But then you have this, on this red one, you have the very sporty look. Not only is the color loud and uh, aggressive, but you have a more sporty uh, characteristic to it. Um, even the wheels these wheels are beautiful, by the way. I absolutely love these. And I like the directional wheel, especially since the name is Nautilus. If you ever look at a Nautilus, the, the sea creature, it's got this kind of look if you were to you know, cut it open and look on the inside of it. That's, that's the way it looks. So I like that. Um, it doesn't look like a Ford Explorer anymore at all. It just looks like a sexy Lincoln. I love this inlay here that goes way further than it needs to. But it can, and the reason why it can is because uh, the new Nautilus borrowed the door handles and the styling from the Continental, which was gorgeous to begin with. These are solid metal. They're just mounted right to the door. They're bolted on there, and they're touched. You don't pull anything. You just put your hand in there, and the door pops open. Um, gorgeous. Then you get on the inside, and... This doesn't even feel like a Lincoln anymore. This feels like, well, this feels like what Lincoln was going for way back in the day. But now, you know, Lincoln kind of lost its way along with Cadillac for a bit. And they were kind of just like slightly overpriced Chevys or slightly overpriced Fords. Um, now, Link, you know, Lincoln is just, ever, I'd say for the past four or five years, they've gone above and beyond and have become this really sexy uh, entry-level luxury vehicle. And uh, 
could easily compete with Mercedes, BMW, and Audi. Um, I love it. There's high quality materials everywhere. There's this <laughs> insanely massive curved screen plus this uh, secondary. Um, I don't. You know, a lot of this is being is redundancies to up here, but you get a ton of information here. You get something like the Mach E's little gauge cluster here, which you know whatever. It makes sense in this Lincoln. I hate that little tiny gauge cluster on the Mach E, but whatever. What I see on these panels here, I hope are animated. Um, these look cool. I don't even know what they are, but they're LED lights of some sort. They look like a graphic that moves. I hope they do. Um, this sound system I heard in a, a previous Lincoln, amazing. Absolutely sublime and uh, you know, and I don't even like, I've said this so many times before, I hate all black interiors. I like this. This looks good. But this is something where I don't have to worry really about the thrill of the drive. I'm here for the chill in the drive. I mean, you get the, I think it's like 21 or 27 points of movement on these seats. The upper bolsters come in, the, the top, you know folds, leans back, the bottom whole thing leans back, the seat bottom curls out and comes back in for the under your thighs, um, this, the wings on the bottom of your side bolsters, those come in, it massages, they're heated, they're ventilated, so much going on with these seats, they are insane, I think they're called magic seats or something like that, but super cool, um, if this is the future of Lincoln, I'm all for it, I love it, and I want one. Oh yeah, see look at that. It looks like there's a texture. I don't know if it's animated or not, but it certainly uh, changes in color. And uh, I would love to know how they got the lights to glow like that. That's cool. Well, we'll I'll have more details on that car very soon. Um, but in the meantime, check out the pictures on Autoblog. All right, we're getting down to the end here uh, before I jump on and switch topics. This is a very long podcast, so if you're watching this and you want to bounce through, by all means, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> if this car looks familiar, that's because it is. It's basically the Lexus RZ. Uh, it's still pretty cool, but this is a Toyota variant, kind of like the um, BZ4X, but a sportier version of it. Um, I want one. I want one right now. I love that they are doing this boomerang style wraparound light signature. It looks great. This looks nothing like a Prius. But then you get on the inside, and I'm just curious. You know, can we ever actually do this in production? I hope so. Uh, but here's a good example of a curved screen gone wrong. <sighs> I saw this in another vehicle not too long ago, and it was a Toyota, but it weirded me out because um, it, there are ways that this just would not work very well. Uh, I think it works fine when you're looking at it like this, but there are some moments and some features that you use that it wouldn't work out so well. But it does have an interesting curve. So it goes down, it curves out, and then it curves back down in waterfalls uh, over this. So you have your buttons for toggling audio and whatnot on this surface. And then up here, you have just an extension of what's up here. But I don't know. It depends on how your hand motions work on this thing. And if you're swiping, like you swipe and then you hit that curve, it would feel weird. I don't know. I like it and I'm looking forward to it. This one, not so much. This kind of reminds me of a Highlander and a Sienna had a baby. And, um, you know, it's sculpted very well. It's pretty elegant. I like some of these. You know, these are LED lights down here on the side and in the front. Very cool. But it's a very sterile and clean interior that sort of bores me. But I love the textures. I love that they put grass here. Everything about the, the overall shape and look of it just feels meh. You know, this isn't a vehicle you would want to drive. This is a vehicle you want to be driven in or you just want to sit back and let it do its thing. Uh, unlike the um, one up here, which feels like you would want to drive this a little bit more. The steering wheel. So here's the interesting thing about yoke steering wheels. 
you don't turn it the whole way. It's drive-by wire, so as you turn like a, a you know a turn like this, the wheels are already completely turned. So depending on how fast you're driving, changes the input and how much uh, turn is actually occurring. You know, because if you were to do this going 60 miles per hour and your wheels completely turned, be a problem. But if you were to do this um, and it only turned the wheels like 5% or 5 degrees, it would be fine because it would just be like a normal lane change or something like that. So yokes are very interesting to use. Uh, they serve a great purpose. Um, they just take a while to get used to uh, because it's not like driving a normal car. Okay, with a normal steering wheel. Uh, real quick, EV tax credits. I'm not going to go through this, but definitely check this out because if you want an electric car and you're trying to figure out, do I get those tax credits? What vehicles actually uh, apply to that? I'll, I'll just make that short for you. It has to be made in America in order for it to get any of the tax credits. Um, some automakers, though, are offering their own version of a tax credit. A lot of it has to be uh, done with um, leasing the vehicle, like Polestar, for example. Um, I believe the Polestar 2 is made in China. So you get some form of a tax credit, it's just not from the government. Uh, it's from Polestar. It, you know, they just didn't want to do like a price slash like Tesla did. They did it in a different way. It really all comes out to the same thing. But it actually benefits you quite a bit more than just the EV tax credit. Because if you don't make enough money to have to pay the government back $7,500 or even close to that, it's kind of pointless. Because um, you don't get, like if you only owed the government four grand, what happens to the $3,500 that's left over? Nothing. You just don't get it. Government doesn't have to spend it. So, you know, it's <clears throat> it's nice that you get some tax break. It could certainly help if you made a decent amount of money and didn't want to have to worry about paying any of it back. But read this website because it'll tell you exactly what models are available for the tax credit and what level of that tax credit you can get. Uh, the next one, really cool, last little hint here. Uh, this is what we're going to get for the new um, Elantra. I freaking love it. I love the Elantra N as it is right now, but I love this even more. And it brings it more in line with uh, what the Sonata now looks like. And you get this full wraparound light bar. Ugh, it's just beautiful. Look at that. Those lights just cut. Um, I don't know. Does it show the rear? Yeah, a little bit. The rear didn't change too much except for down here. This is a bit different. It's the front end and these wheels. Uh, these wheels are freaking awesome. Um, if I could put those wheels on any other car, I would. I would put these on every car I ever owned. Uh, so yeah, that's that. It's the Hyundai Elantra N. Um, they showed it in Shanghai. We're definitely going to get it here in the United States at some point. Ah, the last one I'm going to talk about before... Um, before I call it here, is the uh, Polestar 4. So here's the Polestar 3. It's an SUV. It's a crossover. And then you get the Polestar 4, which is basically the same car, just with a sloped roof. But here's the kicker, because this thing is cool. Um, the Polestar 4, which uh, I don't know what just happened to it. I'm going to Google it. The Polestar 4 has something that no other car has and that is no rear window nothing there is no glass back here at all this doesn't open up there is nothing for you to see behind you uh it's going to use a lot of its safety features they're thinking that this sloped glass up here will allow you to see like a semi truck behind you I don't know your third brake light is here but man this car is sexy it's fast as hell and it's gonna start at about 60 grand so that's phenomenal oh the other thing it, it uh, so the glass you can see out of right here so the glass does come back far enough for you to see a taller vehicle behind you but if like a BRZ was driving behind you you wouldn't know if there was a kid walking behind you you wouldn't know 
not from looking back behind you. What you would notice is the, uh, the there's a camera here and um, the mirror, the rear view mirror is digital. It's a pretty large um, digital mirror so you can see everything behind you and it's got a lot of vision up here and a lot of vision out this way. So, you know, they're hoping that that along with all of its other safety features like the backup sensors, the blind spot monitoring, the rear cross path detection, all that stuff will keep whoever's walking behind you safe or whatever, like if you're pets, uh, and you wouldn't have to hit your um, your kid's bicycle if they left it in the street. All right, I lied. Uh, there is a couple more I'm going to run down real quick. Um, so we're not getting this in the United States ever. We're never getting another uh, or any MG vehicle here in the States, but this is pretty cool. Um, this is a Roadster by MG, and it's called the Cyberster. It's a weird-ass name, but what a cool car. Look at all these lighting elements. Wild. Very conceptual, but going straight to production. And I love this all red interior. It's like a wine interior. Just looks great. Um, next one. Smart is building its portfolio slowly but surely. And here is another knockout uh, vehicle. This is... Um, I think it's called the number three. So the number three is just a slightly bigger version of the one. And uh, so there's the context number one. Um, and then there's the number three, which is quite a bit larger. Uh, but there's going to be a Brabus edition. There's going to be um, just faster. And I believe it's all electric as well. So I, I like it. I wish they would bring this back to the United States. It the front light signature kind of reminds me of the Volkswagen ID4, but overall, this car just looks better than the ID4. And um, I like it. I want to see this thing in person. There's just not. So let's Google this one Smart Number Three. <clears throat> so this uh, Mercedes still has a bit to do with um, Smart. So I believe this shares a lot with like the EQC, I think. Um, I can't remember exactly, but uh, this looks like a very Mercedes interior. In fact, I think this whole center stack is the same as the C-Class or whichever one, but they changed the vents. Instead of being circular, they're these rectangles. And it just looks far more upscale Um than a smart really should be, <laughs> but I love it. I, you know, you got lighting elements around here, lighting elements in here, the light here in the vents in here, you know, just like a Mercedes, there's tons of lighting going on, mood lighting, um, but it looks great. I think it's a fun looking car. I wish this came to the United States. You know, we're not, we don't have the smart cars anymore. Um, so why not get one of these? Americans love SUVs. I think because this is too small of an SUV, I don't know. It's still about the same size as a Mercedes uh, GLC. So I don't know. Maybe that's what they're worried about, that it would compete with the GLC. I don't know. Either way, I like this car and I wish it would come to the States. So Mercedes, if you're listening to me, please bring this to the States. I will buy one just like this. You know what? I say that about a lot of cars and I, I never have the money to buy it, but whatever. Okay, here's the weird one from left field. Buick and Vista. But don't let the look of it be the thing that catches you off guard because it's sexy. It looks great. What should catch you off guard is a couple things. One, it's a Buick. Two, you know, it's youthful. So back to that, the fact that it's a Buick, it's youthful. It looks good. This is what Buick wanted. They wanted to be invigorated so that they could sell to a younger market. They don't want it to be the grandfather's car anymore. So that's why they've done these uh, the GX models on the Encore and the Envision and all and the ST models, uh, Sport Touring. So, you know, this is a great step for Buick if they're trying to be a little bit more youthful. Here's the two things that should really surprise you. One, it starts less than $24,000. So it's like cheaper than a Chevy Trax. <laughs> why? Buick, you should be more expensive than a Chevy. Not cheaper or the same price. But here's the other thing that should get you. While, yes, it's almost the exact same interior as the Encore GX, um, it's the horsepower. Normally, I don't talk about power here uh, on Sketchbook Audio, 
but I have to because it's got 136 horsepower and 162 pound-feet of torque. That really should be all you get for $23,000. Uh, but give me a $30,000 one that has a 2.0 turbo because this thing looks like it should be fast. It's not. This is slow. Really slow. Um, and, you know, it probably feels quick off the line because of the turbo, but... I can't knock them too much because for 23 k that is a great price for that good looking of a car. It's actually too good looking to be for $23,000. But I like the Chevy Trax a lot, the new one. I don't know which one I would get. The Buick because it's got this sexy fastback hatchback looking deal. Or the Trax because it looks like it could actually go off road this time. I don't know. I like it. Um, last but not least, and I don't need to talk about this one too much because uh oh actually you know what there's, there's actually two more um sedans are kind of dying here in the states not too many automakers are putting money into it uh but volkswagen said hey we're gonna keep doing it because we're just gonna use a platform that we're already using and we have to make electric cars anyways because dieselgate so they gave us this the id7 um which is kind of like the id4 just not an suv and a little bit longer thing i don't like about this car there's only one thing i love it overall it's this follow my mouse and all of a sudden it goes from high up to boom it bottoms out why and then it goes back up every class i ever took in automotive design said don't do this because it makes the car look broken it looks like something is wrong with the car you could do it back here you could do it down here where ford does it and, and jeep even but right in the middle just makes the car look like it's broken. So it, it's confusing. It's weird. And it makes these rear windows huge. Bigger than they really need to be. But here's where I'll give them some slack. Uh, it looks pretty good on the outside. It looks better than the um, Jetta. Doesn't look as good as the Arteon in my opinion. But I think the Arteon is just pure sex on wheels. Um, it's this interior. This illuminated digital texture on the dash, it's like taking wood grain and just gutting out all the inserts and putting lights behind it. Genius. It looks amazing. Um, it kind of looks like, though, they forgot to put actual buttons again and they're making the same mistake twice. <sighs> Look, not everybody has been great at making... So, okay, here's how these buttons work. There are no buttons, right? You touch your finger here, and if you want it to get colder, you swipe this way. If you want it to get warmer, you swipe this way. If you want the volume to be up, you go this way. If you want it to go down, you go this way. You get my point. When they don't work, they don't work. Nothing works. And that was a big problem on the ID4, um, on the ID3, uh, and even on um, the new Volkswagen Golf. They did that, and it... It's not been great. A lot of people complain. In fact, I think they actually have to go back and repair a lot of them. Um, and they made an expensive switch to put buttons back in. But for here, I don't know. Maybe this car was already well into production and they just said, well, we have to go with it. We'll make sure that the software is robust enough that it works. I don't know. But uh, the interesting thing about this car is how much space is in this car. Because it's an EV, there's a ton the back leg room is insane for the size of this car it's insane and then you have a lift back so you get a ton of cargo space back here which i love so it's very much um a spiritual replacement i guess or sister to the arteon i just hope it you know does better than the arteon the arteon is not a big hit it's not a big seller but it's a good car it's a great car it looks amazing and um you know it's it's just not an ev and that's where Volkswagen has to go is towards an EV. So you lose a lot of the sexy sculpting that the Arteon has. You get this weird dip here. Um, but you get an EV, you get a lot of power still, and you get a ton of space, more space than even the Arteon had. So I, you know, I got to give credit where credit's due. I think Volkswagen did a great job with this overall. A couple little tiny details I would fix. But I mean, when you look at things like these light signatures, uh, the way the lights dance, um, the amount of space you get, this you get bucket seats. It almost looks like racing bucket seats, front and back. Uh, I like that. 
the wheels are gorgeous directional wheels. Volkswagen's doing a good job with their EV designs, and that goes across to Seat and uh, um, Leon and Cupra. I think, uh, or Cupra. They all look fantastic. So I just wish we got a little bit more of that flavor here in the United States, but you know, who knows? Okay, last but not least, I promise this is the last one. Lancia, oh my gosh. Where have they been? It doesn't even matter because this thing is freaking cool. It's everything I wanted from like a uh, a Delta and an Epsilon and a Stratos and whatever that weird one that Maserati made that was kind of like a Lancia. It's all right here. So this is fashion forward. This is architectural. This is um, ingenuity, sports car. Uh, and it's just everything Italian luxury that you would hope for. And if you read the details on this, which I highly encourage you do, um, or watch this video, you will see that they actually partnered with a um, fashion brand and a lot of these things came to fruition. But <clears throat> the amount of technology that's in this car, this is conceptual, this is 100% concept. But if Lancia could do even 10% of what this car offers, two thumbs way, way up, 10 out of 10, Yes, yes, please. Uh, and I can just only hope that they do. I mean, look at these taillights. They're not even connected to anything other than the top and the bottom. But how are they mounted? Probably to the top. But, you know, they're illuminated all the same. The roof, very clear glass, but it turns somewhat opaque in different, you know, situations. It feels like you're in a spaceship. It looks like you're in a spaceship, but it... It kind of has some curves of like the Stratos as well as uh, the Alfa Romeo um, Mido with the circular taillights as well as the uh, 4C. It just kind of looks like a 4C, but a little bit bigger and a little bit sexier. I don't know. Lancia, if you can do even 10% of this car in production form, I think you got it. But imagine if you did 60% and just kept the silhouette but made all of these things, you know, more production ready. This looks great. And I think, uh, you know, people would really love to be in a Lancia again. And they would talk about it. Uh, Ralph Gilles has a Lancia Delta. And, um, you know, it's funny. I always used to call it Lancia, but it's Lancia or Lancia. Uh, he has a Delta Stradale. And holy shit, is it freaking amazing. But um, I think between him and Klaus Busse, uh, they've done wonderful things with this. And you know, I don't know if Ralph actually had anything to do with this, but he still owns Lancia products. He's still a big fan of that brand. So he's making it relevant again. He's making it fun. So uh, I just don't like the name. Pura HPE. It, it sounds like a sexually transmitted disease. If I'm being honest, HPE, HPV, whatever. Car companies, can you please stop using just letters? Make a word. That's what letters are for, is making words, not just acronyms. Anyways, that's it for today here at Sketchbook Audio. Oh, you know what? No, it's not. Let me quick tell you. If you want to get into any of those art fields I talked about at the beginning of this video, environment design, character design, animation, comic books, car design, whatever it is, you need to find a school that offers those. I would highly recommend a school that actually succeeds in those, not just offers them, because a lot of schools do offer, but you know they're not like the best. You need to be cognizant of where these companies are pulling from. Sure, yes, they will pull somebody randomly, weirdly, low possibility, from schools that are just like, I've never heard of this school before. If you're good and your portfolio speaks to it and it just blows everybody else out of the water, yeah, you'll probably get a job. But it would probably behoove you, and you know what, I take that back. If you go to just any school that at least offers something like product design, industrial design, character design, media, animation, that kind of thing, and you're just a standout student, and you look better or as good as the kids who are going to Art Center, to CCS, to Cleveland Institute of Art, any of those schools, you got a really good chance of making it, pal. 
Whereas if you went to CCS and you were just in there with the rest of them, it would be harder to separate you from the best. So I don't know, it's depending on how you look at it. But those other schools do those things very well. And those automakers, those um, animation studios, movie studios, comic book places, they pull from those bigger name schools. They just have a better relationship with them. So, you know, it, you have two uh, schools of thought on that. So I don't know which one to tell you to, but, you know, Art Center, um, Los Angeles College Art School, whatever it's called. Um, any of the art institutes, Pittsburgh's not there anymore, but um, Art Institute of whatever, there's one in every state, sometimes two. Uh, Pratt Institute in New York, Full Sail down in, in uh, Florida. I think it's in uh, Tallahassee or in Fort Lauderdale. I think it's Fort Lauderdale. Um, so many, uh, College for Creative Studies, Cleveland Institute of Art, SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design, Columbus College of Art and Design. Pick one of these schools and I guarantee you, if you put forth the effort, you will do very well and you will do well outside of school as well. Um, I'm actually taking a clay sculpting class at Macomb Community College. I wouldn't have thought a community college had anything to do with automotive design, but lo and behold, here in Michigan, here in Detroit, in Motor City, yeah, it exists. And I love it. I'm doing really well in it. Um, well, I mean, uh, I'm proud of the progress that I've made and the learning that I've uh, absorbed from it. So it was worth it 100%. And I would highly recommend it if you're into clay sculpting and you want to be an automotive clay sculptor, definitely check that out. Uh, there's a lot of magazines you can get. Um, let me tell you one right now. So there's car styling interior motives that's just a couple of them uh check those out um you can find them online uh you can find them in like barnes and noble has some of those occasionally uh so yeah check those things out if you have any questions shoot them my way leave me a comment whether it's on instagram whether it's on uh, youtube or it's right here on spotify or uh, anchor.fm check them out leave me a message uh, send me a friend request follow me, whatever it is, I will try to get back to your questions and help you guys succeed because that's what I'm here for. Okay, that's it. We're done. Thank you for tuning in to Sketchbook Audio and like always, be good to one another. Uh, we only got this one life and it's best spent loving one another and going out there and having fun, going on an adventure, taking somebody along with you. Maybe it's your dog, maybe it's a, a, a lover, maybe it's a boyfriend, a girlfriend, whatever it may be, or your parents, I don't know, whatever. Go out, Find your own adventure and uh, just have fun. I'm going to go jeeping. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do right now. So thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Ryan Sketch, here at Sketchbook Audio Visually. Bye. And uh, <coughs> may or may not edit that out. <coughs> I'm going to have a sip of, also not sponsored by them, but Mountain Dew Hard. <laughs> I love this. Um it's it's Mountain Dew with alcohol in it. Uh, it's a very low amount, but hey, it's zero sugar and it tastes like Baja Blast uh, with a kick in the glass. Yeah. Mm. So we'll jump into this. Um, 